evening service. Just a few announcements that I uh, want to make mention to before we begin. Uh, we've got a number that are out sick um, at the moment. Uh, among those, uh, Edward and Mary Lou, uh, Harold and Norma Jean. Uh, Norma Jean is doing better. She's just having some trouble with weakness at the moment, and Miss Mary Lou is dealing with weakness uh, and other things at the moment, and Edward is uh, sick as well. He's not tested positive, but he's uh, been staying home to be on the safe side. Um, Kevin Dillon, who uh, teaches one of the classes of the nursing home, currently has COVID at the moment and has asked that we keep him in our prayers because last time he had COVID, he had a, a number of um, difficulties after the fact, and he's praying that that doesn't happen again, so do uh, keep him in your prayers. Uh, Jasmine Borden is doing well after her surgery, uh, but do continue to pray for her that she continues to heal up. Uh, and uh, that's all that I've got as far as those who are sick uh, this evening. As far as leading us in our opening prayer is Jimmy Isbell. Uh, Brother Steve Worley is here uh, this evening to talk to us about the mission work in West Africa. So he'll be doing a presentation on that. And closing us out in prayer will be uh, Charles Lowry. And since I've got nothing else here, I'm going to turn it over to our song leader this evening, Wendell Ryder. Heavenly Father, we come before you today at the close of this beautiful Lord's Day that you have blessed us with, thanking you, Heavenly Father, for all the blessings that you have bestowed upon us. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for the freedom that we have to worship you without any fear or harm from anyone. Pray, dear Lord, that this would continue. We pray that the wars that are being fought now would soon be over. We pray that the leaders of all the countries could look to you for wisdom and guidance to help put an end to these wars and, and our world could turn to some sort of peace, Heavenly Father. We pray, dear Lord, that you would be with each and every one of us. We pray that we would support the people that, that are leading us. We pray that they would do those things, Heavenly Father, that would help us all to get our nation back on the right track. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight thanking you for the congregation here at Spring Valley. We're thankful for Brother Edward and Brother Keith as the elders here. Pray that you would continue to bless them. We pray that the things that they do would always help us to grow in spirit and truth, wisdom and knowledge. Dear Lord, we come to you at this time thanking you for the missionaries. We thank you for people like Brother Worley as, as they work with the, the people in Africa. We pray, Heavenly Father, that much good would continue to come from their work. 
Pray that you would always bless them and give them safe journeys there and back home again. Dear Lord, we come to you at this time asking you also to be with our military, our servicemen and women. We pray that you would continue to watch over them and care for them. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would always guide, guard, direct, and protect them. And we pray that they would soon be able to return home to their, to their loved ones. Dear Lord, we come to you tonight thanking you for everything in this world that you have so bountifully blessed us with, that we have the freedom to enjoy nature, to enjoy the things that are so beautiful around about us, and we pray that we would never take these things for granted. Our Heavenly Father, we pray also that you would be with those that were mentioned here tonight on our sick list. Pray that you would continue to be with them. We pray that you would be with those that are administering to them, the doctors, the nurses, the caregivers. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would always help them to look to you for the strength and, and courage that they need to continue this fight. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would also be with those that are bereaving over the loss of loved ones. Pray that they would also continue to look to you for the strength that they need during their time of bereavement. Dear Lord, we know from time to time that we do say and think those things that are not in accordance with your will. Pray, Heavenly Father, that you would forgive us of those things that stand amiss in our life. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would help us to always do those things that are right in your sight. Come to you, Heavenly Father, asking you tonight to continue with us now through this service. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you would be with Brother Worley as he speaks to us. And dear Lord, we thank you so very much for your son, Jesus, who came to this earth, who gave his life, that we might have freedom from the sin if we would, would repent and live in accordance with your will and we could have that home in heaven with you when our life here is over. All these prayers, Heavenly Father, we pray in Christ's dear name. Amen.
been a crazy three years, huh? Man, I'm telling you, I was born in 1941. My uncles and cousins and everybody, and even my dad, you know, spent five years in World War II away from home and the rations and all of that stuff. They went through that, and then uh, after that, it was the Korean War, and my, my brother went, oldest brother went to that, and then after that, it was the Vietnam War, and I was over there for a year, running around in the jungles, and, and then I spent 22 years in the Navy and traveled and chased Russians all over the world on the sea, and, and then this come up, too. Uh, now we've spent, I spent 30 years in Africa, pretty well 30 years running around Africa, going around, and you guys have paid for it, helping me out, moving me, and buying my gas, and helping me preach the gospel to uh, the largest black populated nation in the world. You know, everybody where I go is black. I mean, it, they're black, and uh, it's... It's like when I come back, when I first come back, I just got back first of June after four months over there. Uh, amongst all these 200 million black people, all right, well, when I come back, you guys, it's like technicolor in America. You guys have all different colored eyes and all different color hair and all different color skin. And I mean, it's, it's really amazing in a lot of ways. Uh, but it's been a time. And I guess I haven't gotten the corona or COVID-19, I guess you call it, because I've had malaria so many times in my life. And they just, Lord didn't never visit me with the COVID-19 yet, me or my wife. And I took the shots, but Dee Dee didn't, and neither one of us had gotten it, praise God. And I was running back and forth and everything, but... I came back after four months this year, and two days after, I got pains in my stomach and uh, had to go in and get uh, my gallbladder taken out. They, you know, there's no dignity in hospitals at all. I mean, they put you in a gown that don't have a back on it and run all kinds of people around you and, and lock you down in a room and operate on you. It took them 80 years to get me into a hospital. Uh, you know, just to operate on me, and they got me. But I'm well, I'm doing fine, everybody's going well, and I want to show you what some of the things that are happening, and listen, I don't believe it half the time when I'm looking at it and, and participating in it. The Lord has blessed our life so much, and there's, the work is growing so fast in Africa. You know, the work as the work grows, it has to have material things to to complete it, you got to have a church building, you got to have songbooks, you got to have communion, and you got to have material things, and you got to have places to where they can worship outside uh, or inside out of the rain because they're carrying their babies and, and their children. So, the material things, and then if you got so many churches, we started exploding in the churches in the northern Nigeria, and we didn't have preachers that spoke the Hausa language. So we had to start a school, and we started a school together. And this is all what we've done together. In Nigeria, you'd hear me say, Gamma alayayi kamnar de niahar abadadansa. Hai fa fe shika de doma du kamwana yarba ragareshi karai har abada. And that's for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God loves Muslims. He loves everybody. He created everybody. My, my Muslim friends I call brothers and sisters, be, and they understand because I explain it to them. They are my brothers and sisters in Adam and Eve. They got arms and legs. They're not as pretty as me, but they're still my brothers and sisters. And God, he don't like what they do. He don't like what they, they profess. He don't like the God that they worship. But he loves them because he created them in, in his image, just like he did me and you. And if we can look past all of the things that they do, 
and see them as our brothers and sisters in Adam and Eve, then we'll want to make them our brothers and sisters in Christ. And that's how we have to look at it. And it's tough sometimes because they don't treat us <laughs> very nice sometimes. But we've got to look past their own conduct and see them. Now, Paul went to Jerusalem and reported what the Lord did in his ministry, and that's what I use as an example of doing tonight with you, is I'm just going to report to what God has done through us, you and I, common people, just normal people that are trying to live the life in respect and obedience to God's word and look to him for perfection. Of course, Nigeria, the continent of Africa is 51, 51 or 53 countries. You can put the United States and, and China and India and all of them uh, into the continent. The, it's huge. And uh, I go into West Africa and to East Africa, and uh, I work in four different countries, really. But I'm going to show you some of the few things that is going on, because we'd be here for days if I'd try to get everything that's going on just in our ministry. Of course, Nigeria is the largest black populated nation in the world. Uh, South Africa has 38 million people. Kenya has 28 million people. Nigeria has over 200 million people. With the rate of birth uh, projected in 100 years, uh, Nigeria would be the largest populated nation in the world in a hundred years. In southern Nigeria, we have over 10,000 churches of Christ. They were started back in the 50s by one Bible correspondence course out of Nashville, Tennessee. It went to Germany, and then it went to, South, to, to Nigeria. A policeman, and uh, two policemen actually, got the Bible correspondence course, and by the time the first white missionary got to Nigeria, uh, about 10 years later, there were 10,000 New Testament Christians in southern Nigeria. They love to read, they love education, and they are smart. We have brought, you and I have brought 10 Africans here. Well, first, the second one went to Heritage Christian. The other 10, I guess it's 11 of them that we brought. The other 10 went to Freed Harbor. All of them graduated. All of them went home. All of them are still in the ministry. And that is almost a miracle, if you stop to think about it, because they, they come over here and they work. None of them stayed four years. Every one of them graduated early. Every one of them graduated with top honors. All of them have master's degrees. And all of them are working in the ministry. We did it. With God's help, we did it. I don't know how we did it, but we did it. It's done, and it continues to grow because it's people, and if people are spirit-led by the Spirit of Christ, we can accomplish anything that God wants us to do. What we do in Nigeria is we decide on what we want to do for the Master. We prepare as much as we can for it. We pray for it. We fast for it. And then we wait for the door to open by God. When the Lord opens the doors, we run through. And that's what we've done for years. We started school that way. We started all kinds of projects that way because they're people and they're made up of people. School is in West Africa. This is the dormitory. Uh, this, is, this was the whole school. We built this right next to the church building we built up in northern Nigeria among 52 million Muslims. This, this was the whole school. We started with 12 students back in 1989, and uh, here we go. This is now the women's dormitory. We went co-ed about 10 years ago. We got about 25% of our uh, student body is, is uh, women. This is our library. We've taken tons and tons of songbooks and Bibles and religious books to come and study with us in the libraries. Uh, we try to teach them religion. While we're teaching them their religion and let them read their books, 
we convert them to Christianity because they see the fallacy in their own religion. This is our administration building. All of these are built by hand, no machinery. We mix the concrete, we make our own block, we mix the concrete, the women carry the concrete on the headpans, and we build the buildings by hand. But they're all strong, they're all reinforced, and they're all uh, registered with the federal government of Nigeria. The school is completely accredited up to the four-year level. I built this house for Didi. It's on school land. It's owned by the school. It's our guest house. We've had 18 people one time spend over a month there. Had four of our, well, Adam Cox took his twins, and I took my granddaughters, two granddaughters, and we spent 18 of us spent a month in this house in Nigeria. <laughs> it was a lot of fun. I taught the kids to eat termites. <laughs> it was fun. Uh, <laughs> they were good. They taste like popcorn. This is our classroom block building. We built that about 10 years ago. Uh, and they're all, they're all class one buildings, metal roofs. Uh, all of our uh, roofing is sheet metal. Uh, our rafters are two-inch angle iron, and uh, this one will sleep, what do we say, 56 rooms and, and take 224 students or 448 students if we double up everybody. <laughs> and they sleep, I mean, they, they crowd in, and they, we, uh, they cook their own food. All the students have the first two years of the four-year degree program we have a two-year program, a three-year program, a four-year program, and then we have a four-year degree accredited program, just like the one at Freed Harbin you'd get from Freed Harbin. Uh, we, we cater to the preachers in the villages, into the cities, and into missions. So uh, all of our students, uh, since the beginning, all of our students had to spend every weekend in the villages, off campus, in evangelism. We teach them Bible, and we teach them evangelism. Over Just in our evangelism program alone, since we started, we've baptized over 13,000 people in just our evangelism programs alone. And that's documented because it's programmed. And we have our st assign our students every weekend. They're out on the street teaching and preaching uh, in the local areas. So... It's a good program. It's a good school. And our, our uh, graduates are hired. Most of them are hired before they, they graduate by the churches in the South. This was our chapel about two years or three years ago. This was our chapel. Every, every day we have chapel. And we, we've grown from nine students to 137 now, I think we've got. Uh, as far as students go, and we'd pack them into a room every day and chapel. So uh, two years ago, right in front of our dormitory, uh, we decided we'll build us an activities building to where we'd, we could have chapel in a, in a bigger building. So we started building a building and uh, putting it up, and what we do is we use 11-inch cement block. We make our own block with our block machines, one at a time, and we built this building, then we plaster it with cement over the block, and uh, it's all rebarred and pillared, and this is what we've got now. It took us uh, almost a year and a half to build this building. It's terrazzo floors like in a theater. It's stone floors, and, uh, and it happened just in time when COVID-19 hit. In March of 2000, a guy walked up to me and said, uh, if you want to go home, you need to go tomorrow if you want to go home this year. Uh, they're shutting down the world. And so I flew back home the next day. So, But we finished the building because we had all the contracts made and we finished the building. I was here, they were there. We finished the building, so COVID-19 hit and they shut down the universities and schools in Nigeria, our private schools. Our schools kept going because we could st go this six feet and we've turned this is this is the activities building that we built it's beautiful and uh, we kept our classes going and we graduated for three years we graduated our students but we didn't hold the graduation ceremonies we graduated them and sent them home 
as preachers. In those last three years, we built, we started chickens. We've got 500 chickens right now, uh, layers and broilers. Uh, if you've ever raised chickens, there's nothing worse in this world, I believe, than scalded feathers. I had 500 chickens when I was growing up, and we had to scald the chickens in a tin, uh, what is number 10 wash pan out back over a fire, and then pick those feathers off. And boy, that, that smell still haunts me. I really don't like that smell of scalded feathers. It's just a special smell. But this is our chicken house, and uh, we, we have an agricultural program. We, we do gardening, and we do chickens, and we do rabbits, and uh, we teach our students how to do this their first two years at the school. We started chickens. We had to double our water supply, which is, you see that one tank. What we did is we, we built our cradles, mixed the cement on the ground, built our cradle, manufactured another tank locally, and put the tank in place. Uh, we doubled our water supply. So we've got these two for the school and, uh, and a borehole too. So we get water most of the time, but the students still struggle. And then we added, last year we added this storeroom on the activities building. We put the basketball court in the activities building too. So the students can, during the rainy season, five, eight months out of the year, is rainy season, they can play basketball. Or young people need exercise. They're going to get it no matter what we do. And that's why I think Fried Hartman and all of our, our colleges and universities have uh, academic programs and they also have uh, sports programs or whatever. Uh, three years ago, we decided, well, no, two years ago we decided, in 2001, we decided we we're going to build a medical clinic for our students because at night if they get sick, they can't go off campus, uh, not safely. It's just dark falls and it's like the cities of Chicago and New York or wherever. You don't go traveling at night. Even the roadblocks where the police are, the police get drunk and soldiers get drunk and you just don't go out at night. So. so so we started manufacturing block. This is our block industry, one block at a time. In a year, we, we manufactured 20,000 blocks, 11-inch cement blocks. And then last year, or this year, when I went this year, we started our medical clinic. Uh, this is on our land. This is on our campus. It's walled. We started our foundation. Then we build it in the German floor. Everything is mixed by hand. <laughs> uh, and this is our medical clinic now. We've got the, we're putting in the floors right now, this week. Uh, we're pouring the terrazzo floors. You see the windows and doors. And we're going to hire a medical team. Not hire. We're going to lease the building to a medical team of Christian doctors and nurses that have graduated from our medical programs in Nigeria with the African Christian Hospitals Foundation. We're going to lease this building with the special considerations to our students. And this will be run by a Christian mission team or doctor medical team, and they'll lease the building from us and contract it from us by the year, or by every couple years, I guess. And we'll have our own uh, medical clinic for our students. Like I say, the first two years, all of our students have to grow their own food. Uh, we don't have central feeding. The churches, the local churches support our students or the ch churches that send our students to us uh, support our students. They have a little kerosene burner stove. They'll form teams of about five or six guys and girls and they'll cook their own food uh, on a little kerosene stove and uh, they eat. And, uh, they're all lean. Most of them are lean, I'll tell you. They're, we grow rabbits now. We're starting to grow rabbits. We, like I say, 500 chickens. And uh, we got a fish tank, a huge fish tank that uh, once, twice a year we harvest our fish. We got catfish. and uh, That's almost scriptural to have catfish in it. And, and, you know, 
where I'm at in Savannah, Tennessee, we're supposed to be the catfish capital of the world. And that's the physical, that's the plant, that's the, the material thing that we need to, to function as a, as a school to turn out preachers and Bible teachers uh, for the brotherhood, for the world. We have graduated over 700 students. Now we're graduating uh, in the last, I guess, 12 years. We've, we're, this is our whole campus team. This includes our faculty. This includes our, our maintenance people. This includes everybody. We've got 30 people that we're working with, 30 of us. And we're do, they're doing a great job. They've been with us ever since the beginning, just about. I think we've lost two or three teachers, and that's about it. They stick with us. Uh, all of our, our, our people work together. There's, I guess there's about eight tribes or seven tribes represented in our faculty. This is our teaching staff here. We got 12 on our teaching staff. These guys teach Bible. They teach English. They teach computer skills. And uh, all of these people have master's degrees. Two of them have PhDs. Uh, they're highly educated in Greek and Hebrew and uh, health and uh, English. One of our ladies teaches English. She's got, uh, she's finishing up her PhD. We've got two more going to have their PhDs. These are our teachers of that 12. These are the ones that are in the PhD program. When you're affiliated with a university, a federal university, your teachers have to maintain standards of education and they have to have continuing education. Well, the church in uh, Montgomery, Alabama, the River Chase Church heard about this and they said, you need to get your people into the PhD programs in two universities in Nigeria so they can qualify on up the road to become our own university. So. They're paying these people uh, tuition. And two of them's going to finish their PhDs this year, and the other five are in the PhD program. Pretty soon we'll have a faculty of all, or pretty well a lot, most of them are, have their PhDs. You say, why is that important? It, it's important for credentials wise, for education, uh, for the people to go into other countries too. And when you go into another country, the country says, what are you doing here? And you say, well, I'm going to preach the word. And they say, well, why do we need you? And you have to give them your qualifications as a preacher or as an uh, educator. And, and if, you have a, if you have a record of American education institutions in a Muslim country, uh, it limits you. All of our teachers that are going north into Libya and into Egypt in the future. And, li and we have two of our uh, graduates in Bangladesh teaching. that has been teaching in Bangladesh for 10 years that have their, their qualifications. They, they've been qualified. And there's people from other countries coming to us now. We've, we've had 50 people graduate from 12 different African and Asian countries. Now stop and think about that, if you will. 50 people came from 12 different foreign countries to get educations with us, to get their degrees, four-year Bible degrees with us, and went back home. And they're preaching and teaching in their own countries now. Some of them have only started their own schools. And we're it's a powerful system that we've, we've been blessed with. Our last graduation, I said, was 2019. That was our graduation ceremony. And we've had, we have, we graduate about 40 a year uh, is what we do. And they, some of them have two-year degrees, three-year degrees, four-year degrees. And most of them have their four-year degree academic uh, Bible degrees uh, accredited. But this year... We decided to have the, the, next, the last two years plus this year's graduation. So we had three graduation ceremonies this year. 
<laughs> it was it was a circus. I'm telling you, I I took uh, 90 foot cables and in that in that uh, activities building, and I I hung 12 flags of the our graduates from 12 different countries. I hung the 12 flags, and that I turned that activities building from a warehouse look to a to a celebratory look. We had over 500 people attend this graduation ceremony this year. We had, we graduated 115 graduates in a graduation ceremony. I mean, they were lined up across the campus and then they came into the building uh, and, and they all marched. You know how the, the processions and all of the, the pomp and the ceremony and they all had the robes and they dressed us up in robes and we had the flags flying and the, uh, the people are standing in the doors and outside in the win uh, you know, looking in the windows because we were just packed in and it was, but we had enough room in that big building and they put us, you know, in the academia and uh, Randy Baker came from uh, Rogersville and spoke at our commencement and Adam Cox spoke at our lectureship, and we tie this graduation of all of these people into a three-day lectureship to at the same time. So it, the, our campus just is just unbelievably celebratory, you could say. Everybody's celebrating. Plus uh, the, what is that? Uh, Kyle Butt gave me 750 good Bibles, about $60 Bibles, their study Bibles, 750 of them, and every graduate got a Bible. And uh, uh, you talk about a gift. That's a gift to a preacher. I mean, especially if they're going back into the villages uh, to make their studies and continue their studies. And their, there, there's, a, there's a look of it. That's pretty nice, isn't it? That looks good. I mean, we were really having a good time. Talk about singing. Kai, they can sing, let me tell you. They're like, they're like we used to be here whenever I first came to Spring Valley. You had an alto section back in this area. I don't know how many of them there were, but they would raise the roof. And you, you, you guys used to have uh, Faso singing when you sang the notes. I remember that. Uh, boy, I really used to love to come here just to hear the singing. You in Red Bay, down in Red Bay, and over in Cherokee. Uh, I don't know where any Faso singing is anymore, but I mean, it used to, and the altos used to knock this place out just about. It was, it was a really enjoyable, and, and they sing. They sing about one-third our speed because they speak British English. So they don't speak fast, uh, and they sing slow. Between the verses, you can almost go to sleep <laughs> because they sing so slow, and you, you think, come on, let's pep it up a little bit here. But they do. They sing, and they, they sing good, though. They really do. And it's a, it was a wonderful experience for us. Our graduates are scattered all over the world right now. We've got graduates in Australia. We got them in Asia and Bangladesh. We got them all over Africa, and they're everywhere. And our alumni is over 700 now that we've graduated. And the churches are growing. We're moving. And God says this in Isaiah, and we need to understand this. And we, this has been one of my, this has been one of my pillars of my strengths. For in Isaiah, he says in 55, he says, So will my word be which goeth forth from my mouth. It will not return unto me empty without accomplishing that which I desire and without succeeding in the manner for which I sent it. God guarantees us that. He says, you speak that word. He says, that word will produce what I want it to do in my time, in my place. It will not be in vain. If you put it out there, it will do what it's supposed to do. And God's responsibility is to provide that word. The sinner's responsibility is to receive the word. All my responsibility is, is to sow the seed and teach the ones that accept it. 
It's not my responsibility to save the people. And that's what we did in Africa. We sow the seed and we teach our students, you just go out there and sow the seed and whatever God intended for that seed to do in that place with those people, those people's responsibility is to obey God. It's not yours. You're not responsible for those people. You're responsible just to spread the seed. So be joyful, be happy, and spread the seed. It'll let God's word do what it's supposed to do. I'm going to conclude with this. The preachers that graduate from our school form their own groups. And like in a whole area of northern Nigeria, we had a group of preachers form what they called the Northern Campaign for Christ Preachers. And in about five states in northeastern Nigeria, which is 99% Muslim, these preachers would, once a year, they'd, they'd pick a, vill- a village where they wanted to start a church of Christ, and the preachers, about 12 of them or 20 of them, would, would go to that village and stay two weeks. And some of them would take their wives to cook. And they'd stay two weeks and have a, an old-fashioned tent meeting, gospel meeting, like we used to do at the Laramore House across the, across the river. Remember, they all come in their covered wagons, and they'd stay for two weeks or stay for a month, and they'd have a, the camp meeting. Well, these preachers did this uh, for years, and I've stayed away from them. They raised their own money, and they chipped in and, and brought their wives and made their own food and they came to me this year and they said, listen, Steve, we need you to help us. And I said, what? He says, we need a, a van to carry our equipment to the village because in the villages that we're going to, they don't have electricity. And I said, well, what are you going to do with the van when you're not in the village? And they said, well, loan it to somebody. I said, it won't work because they won't maintain it and it'll deteriorate. I said, I've got let me talk to the president of the school because a couple years ago I brought two buses from Murray, Kentucky. Two school buses, 11 row. That's one of them. I said, uh, what you guys need, what we need to do is, is get us a, what we call it, I called it a salvation station. That's what I called it. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> so we brought this bus up to my uh, up to the guest house where I've got a generator and uh, air compressor and other stuff to work on it. And we cut a hole in the side. You see that blank, black spot? That's a big door. We cut a hole in the side of that bus, took the doors out, or the, all the seats out, and we put a big rack up on top uh, that's 10 foot long. And uh, we called this a salvation station. And what we do is we're going we're gonna to do this one this is where your door comes down, you see, and it's a stage. And then the rack, you put a 10-foot screen on that thing, video screen, and you can show Jesus films, the Jewel Miller's films, the Bible films. You can show that. we got a generator we're going to put in there and put it out in the bush and run the cables in and plug into this thing. So we have lights, we have audio uh, the preacher can stand out there on the stage and preach. We can show a 10-foot movie on video, and it'll so set in the village. And when the, the church wants to have a gospel meeting, it'd be like a church going over to another congregation and saying, look, we want to rent the bus, the, the Salvation Station. So we bring it over here and set it right there, and we run our generator out, and we have a portable baptistry that goes with it. And we have two station keepers, one a driver and one a a guy that takes care of all the audio. And uh, we have gospel meetings in the village. People come for hundreds of miles around to see this. I know. I've been in the villages. They don't have electricity. And you show them a, you show them a, a Bible film. You show them a preacher. You give them audio to where they can hear. And man, they'll come by the hundreds. You watch. We're going to keep this at the school. And uh, when groups want to, to lease it, they can give us money to uh, put a deposit down to cover any kind of, of damage that's done to it. And we'll give it to them for two weeks. We'll deliver it. One of our drivers will deliver it. A station keeper will stay with it. 
run all the equipment for it, and they can have gospel meetings with sound and with lights all night long. And it will be that way. And we're going to put this thing on the road, Lord willing, uh, this year. That's our salvation station. I'm not going to tell you today about the church in Chad. You know, the church in Chad has been there for years, and we've got three church building, or school buildings now with a huge church building beside it. Well, we got 15 acres, and we got 1,100 kids in Chad in a primary school. We started a primary school with our preachers in Chad, our graduates. They started a primary school. They've got 1,100 kids, and it's French. And they registered with the federal government, and the federal government's giving them materials, and, and the kids are all village kids. They didn't have any schooling. They can't read and write. We gave them a curriculum, and we added Bible and and English to the curriculum and, and the kids are 1100 of them and they found 125 of them didn't have families that they were sleeping in our buildings at night because they didn't have families to go to so we built a building and we put some bunk beds in it now we got a what a, a orphanage <laughs> we feed them one meal a day out of a big pot uh, of rice and that's better than nothing and uh and they're, they're kids. They're unreal as far as they think it, that I'm a spirit because I'm not black. Because human beings are black. And if you're white and you're a human being, you must have your skin peeled off. They got a name for me. It's a person with his skin peeled off. And they're scared of me. But they want to touch me because it's good luck. So when I'm, you see where I'm at, I'm right in the middle of them, and they, they all want to touch me, and they're kids. They're just like ours. I mean, they're unbelievably beautiful and innocent and just great kids. Uh, uh, that's the country of Chad. We got 35 preachers over there now that weren't there before. When we started, there was no churches of Christ in the whole country of Chad. Now we got 35 just in the southern part. When we started together, there was no churches in Niger, the country north. It's two French countries, two English. Now there's two churches in Chad, in Niger. This is the Church of Christ in Niger. It's French-speaking. Uh, primitive. <laughs> there's no cars hardly in the whole country. They're in the cities, but they're, they use donkeys and, and uh, carts. And it's the same thing everywhere. People need to be born again. They need to die and they need to come back by the very power of God as a new creature and be added to his kingdom, the church, and to live the Christian life. And that's what we do. That's who we are. That's what you've done. You've got, your, you've got an influence that defies the imagination 9,000 miles from here and you've never seen it. And that's just a piece, a very small piece of what's going on. Our teachers in Joss have been with us for 20 years, and they are just, they could make four times their salaries just going across the street and teaching at the federal universities, but they don't. They're unbelievable people. And they're from six different tribes. There's Igbos and Yorubas and houses and men and women and all different kinds of people, tribally. And we all work together. And it's the people. It's the same as in America with the churches here. We've got churches in major cities. We've got churches in countries, in the, in the countryside. And we're all alike. We're all seeking the truth. We're all com comforted by the Holy Spirit. There's no remedy for what we give out. There's no competition because it's the truth. We have the truth. And it set us free. That's who we are. That's what we are. That's what we give people at no cost to them. At no cost whatsoever. We give them free life. We give them life. I always leave a minute, then I'm going to quit. You got any questions? Dee, Dee says, my wife says, of 58 years, says to say hello. She's doing well. 
our granddaughters went to their mother after nine years, and we are living like two elderly people now, <laughs> instead of having two 12-year-old and 15-year-old granddaughters with us. Uh, but the girls are doing well, and uh, Didi will go with me next year, Lord willing. I'll leave in September. I'm going for six weeks back over uh, to finish this medical clinic, and then we'll go probably for four or five months next year uh, back to Jaws. If you'd like to come and visit with us, you're welcome. Uh, like Randy and, and Adam came this year, two of them, but Would we've had a whole... Eternals? I'm sorry? Would you make us eat termites? Do what? Would you make us eat termites? <laughs> no, I don't make you do anything. <laughs> but they're good. They're, they're about as big as your finger. They come out at night, one, two days out of the year. and They, they look like dragonflies. They've got like little transparent wings are about two inches long, and you pull the wings off. And you can fry them, and they make their own oil. They're 100% protein. They taste like popcorn. If you eat a chicken, you eat anything, I'm convinced. <laughs> I think chicken, chickens is good, but man, the, they're the, the I'm, like I say, I raised them when I was a kid. I, I love chickens, but nah, I'll take termites on a half shell every once in a while. But yeah, people have come, hundreds of people have come, and we've not lost anybody. They stay 10 days or 12 days. We've taken groups to Uganda. We've taken groups to Nigeria. Uh, through the years, preachers have come. Uh, it will change your life, literally. Uh, it's, a, it's a good experience. And the people are just unbelievably friendly. You know, you have more influence. Let me close with this. You have more influence on the Nigerian people than I, I can ever have in, in one way. And that's to convince them that, that they're loved by Americans. They know I, I go over there because of the Lord, uh, because that's what I do. That's who I am. But when you go over, you're normal people. You're farmers, you're mothers, you're, you're normal people. And you go 9,000 miles to go to Nigeria to say, I love you. It's what you say, really, by your very presence. You go to see the work, you go to, you know, I know, I know you go to, you go to see the work and you go, to, uh, there's curiosity there too, but baseline what you're telling these people over there, and they really realize it, that you guys are normal. And the reason you go over there is because you love them, you care for them. And boy, that comes across powerful, because I see the faces and I see the people of the people, and I see the friendships that's developed through the years. Yeah. It's, a, it's, a, it's an experience. If you ever have an opportunity to do it, do it. And spread the love of God, your love that you have for God and for his creation at every chance you get, even here. Thank you. Love you. Uh, Ed's not here tonight. He's got a cough. In the next week, get a hold of him and tell him something good about me. <laughs> I miss that guy. I thought he'd be here tonight. I'll call him but, and pray for him, please. Thank you very much, and God bless you. And you know the invitation uh, is always out, that if you want the church to pray for you, you want to become a Christian. If you're not a Christian, you need to become one. 11 years in the United States Navy, after Vietnam, I decided to become a Christian. And I spent another 11 years in the United States Navy repairing submarines <coughs> as a Christian. And those years were wonderful. The second half of my life as a, as a, a career military uh, sailor was better as a Christian than it was as a non-Christian, let me tell you. There's nothing you can't do better in this life as a Christian than you can as a non-Christian. I'd rather have a Christian policeman come to my house. I'd rather have a Christian fireman come to my house. I'd rather have a Christian worker come to my house because they are Christ-centered. 
And if you, you're waiting, don't wait no more. Become a Christian now so you can enjoy the benefits because it's all benefits. It's the beauty of living. Jesus said, I have come to give you life. I'm just sorry it took me 11 years in the United States Navy to come alive, to find life. But when I found it, I've never regretted it. It's like marriage. Never regretted marriage, neither. <laughs> God bless you. If you're subject to the gospel and dedication, once you come while we stand and sing, please. Bring Christ to life. So free our from sin. He will create anew. Make whole again. Let us pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've given us, the opportunity we've had to hear of the work that's going on in, in Africa and to see the wonderful rich blessings that you've bestowed upon your children. And Father, we pray that as we go about this period that we reflect back on the Christ and the blessings we have through him and how he was willing to have his body broken so that we could receive those blessings. And it's in your Son, Christ's name, that we pray. Amen. Let's again pray. Our God and Heavenly Father, we now come before you, remembering the blood which was shed on Calvary's cross, and pray, Father, that as we partake of the fruit of the vine, that we think back to that blood and how great of a blessing it is to us as Christians. And it's in your Son, Christ's name, that we pray. Amen.
there anyone at this time who needs to give? Okay. Again, let's go to God in prayer. Father, we reflect back on the wonderful blessings that you've given us. And we've had the opportunity to see what just a portion of the funds you've bountifully blessed us with have been able to accomplish in West Africa and how it's been beneficial to so many souls. And as we reflect back on those blessings that have been upon them and how much you've given to us, that we're willing to give back with a willful and cheerful heart. And it's in your son Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Bow and pray with me, please. Our most gracious and loving God and Father, we come to close this another beautiful Lord's Day evening that you bless us with. We pray that everything that's been said and done here today has been acceptable in accordance to your will. Lord, we thank you most of all and above all for Jesus Christ, for his death, his burial, and most of all for his resurrection. We realize, Lord, if we'll live our life according to your will, that when our life here is over, we can have a home in heaven with you. Lord, we're so thankful for Brother Steve for the work he does in Africa. We pray that you'll continue to bless him and the work, bless him and his wife as they travel, keep them safe. We're also so thankful for Andrew and Kareem. We pray that your richest blessings on them and their work they do here. Or we're so thankful for the material blessings that we so often take for granted for our food, clothing, shelter, our health, strength, and well-being. pray that you'll always... Provide us with all this, Lord. We pray now that you'll be with those that are sick of our congregation, especially those who are battling cancer. And pray that you'll restore them to their health. And be with all those of our community also that are sick and battling cancer and other illnesses and just dealing with pain, Lord. Please go with us through the night, through the, this week as we go to work. Keep us all safe and please bring us back to the next point in time without the loss of one. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.